Good morning and thanks for joining us. I'm Brianna Keeler. And I'm Poppy Harlow. This morning, the North Korean point man for nuclear negotiations is on his way to New York. The president calls the visit by Kim Yong-chol, who is also a former North Korean spy chief and current vice chair of the ruling party there. A solid response, in the president's words, to his letter of last week canceling that summit with Kim Jong-un. It's also a solid indication, along with meetings underway in the DMZ and the summit host nation of Singapore as well, that a Trump-Kim meeting is back on track, potentially as soon as June 12th, which is two weeks from today. And our Caitlin Collins is following all of the developments at the White House. Caitlin? Yeah, Brianna, this is just one more thing that goes to show just how each side is racing to get that canceled meeting back on track. That meeting that was canceled just five days ago with President Trump confirming that North Korea has dispatched a top aide to come to the United States to engage in more discussions in hopes of setting that meeting back up on June the 12th in Singapore. Though I should note that nothing has been officially reinstated and the White House has not formally announced that this meeting is back on, though they are certainly acting as if it is. Several things going on, including this top aide coming to the United States. Uh, we also know that several national security aides inside the White House are worried that there's not enough time to get this meeting back on track for June the 12th. But the President Trump uh, is not concerned about that and said he's pressing, pressing his aides to get that meeting set up again for June the 12th in Singapore. Uh, and we also know that what the White House is looking to get out of that meeting seems to have shifted some. Uh, before there was talk about what the North Koreans were willing to uh, sit down and talk about what kind of agreement they were willing to come to. And now we are told that people inside the White House, like National Security Advisor John Bolton, are advising the president that just sitting down with Kim Jong-un and being face to face with him in Singapore for a cursory talk is enough of a diplomatic achievement that could later lead to more serious talks down the road. So that is what they are looking at now with the president. Uh, seems to be gung-ho on getting this meeting back on track, uh, having it happen in just two weeks from now. Uh, he's been tweeting several times this morning, once his latest saying he's going to focus his energy on North Korea and several other issues here at the White House, uh, trade one being one of those. Um, instead of focusing on what he says is the rigged Russia witch hunt that the president believes should be investigating Hillary Clinton, Russia, the FBI, the Justice Department, President Barack Obama, former FBI Director James Comey, and former Attorney General Loretta Lynch. But I should note that just two hours after the president said he was going to start focusing on North Korea, he tweeted again uh, saying that he believes the media is on a disinformation campaign. Poppy and Brianna. All right, Caitlin Collins, thank you so much. A lot of questions about who this former spy chief is. Uh, what does it mean that he's coming to New York to have these talks? Let's go to Matt Rivers in Seoul, South Korea. Tell us more about him. Yeah, this is a very high-ranking North Korean official with a bit of a notorious past. Uh, let's let's give you a little bit more detail here. As you guys mentioned off the top, he's the former spy master uh, in North Korea, and he is widely considered to be Kim Jong-un's right-hand man, a top nuclear negotiator. But here in South Korea, he is not well-liked. He is accused of being the uh, mastermind behind uh, the sinking of a U uh, South Korean naval ship called the Chan'an, killed 46 sailors uh, when that ship went down. And he's also uh, behind something Americans would be familiar with, the 2004. 14 Sony hack over the movie uh, The Interview, which of course our viewers will remember uh, featured a plot to assassinate uh, Kim Jong-un. But yet, this is the man, despite his past, that the Americans will have to deal with. This is the person the North Koreans are sending uh, moving forward. But this is just part of an overall diplomatic push here uh, with multiple parties involved. You got the Chinese talking to the North Koreans, making sure their interests are in play. And then we're also hearing from the White House that Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe will be meeting with President Trump before this summit happens, perhaps during next week's G7 meetings in Canada, perhaps in Washington, D.C. after that. But clearly, there are lots of countries with strategic interests in this part of the world who want a seat at this table or at least have their interests represented if and when this summit goes forward. All right, Matt All right, Rivers. Matt Rivers. We just, we both say thank you to Matt Rivers. <laughs> thank you, right, Matt. Marie? Thank you. So many thanks, thanks so Matt, much. from both of us. <laughs> and joining us now to discuss this, we have Tony Blinken, CNN Global Affairs Analyst and former Deputy Secretary of State. And we also have retired Rear Admiral John Kirby, CNN Military and Diplomatic Analyst and a former State Department spokesman, former Pentagon uh, spokesman as well. Um, so to you, Admiral, uh, the, the, the South Korean news agency is reporting at this point in time that a high-ranking North Korean official is coming to the U.S. as early as tomorrow after a stop in Beijing. What does that tell you about 
the summit and, and any expectations that we should have for it? Tells me three things, Brianna. First, that the summit is certainly more likely to happen now than not. I mean, if they're sending Kim Young Chol here, that means that and because he's so close to Kim, that tells me they're taking this very, very seriously. <laughs> Number two, it tells me that they're going to be prepared. They're going to be ready. I've been talking to Korea experts over the last couple of weeks to get myself to sort of better understand all this. And to a one, uh, they tell me uh, that the North Koreans will be ready. They understand the nuance. They understand the details. They know how complicated arms control type negotiations are. They will be studied. And in fact, Kim Jong-chol being here tells you just how seriously they're taking this and how ready they want to be. Thirdly, it tells me how much China wants to have uh, at least a figurative seat at the table. They won't be in the summit, but they want their interests represented, and that's why they've got him coming to Beijing. They met with Kim Jong-un twice there. Uh, the only thing that the, that the Chinese like less than a, a nuclear-armed North Korea is the specter of a Korean peninsula that is completely aligned and united uh, with the West and with the United States. And so they want to yeah. make sure that, uh, that their interests get, get represented. Tony, to you, I mean, this is the, the art of the deal president. He's the one who said he can make deals that past administrations have not been able to make, namely peace on the Korean Peninsula would be a huge one. Um, but you say, look, the Kim family in totality has become masterful at the art of the steel. What do you mean? <laughs> There's a long track record uh, of negotiations with North Korea that ended in failure. And the North Koreans have been very, very good at doing three things, stringing out negotiations, wringing out economic concessions, and then ultimately walking away from any hard commitments they make. So we have to be very, very cautious heading into this that we're not heading for a repeat of exactly that kind of uh, a process and dynamic. And by the way, that's exactly what President Obama tried to get out of, to, to break that, that pattern. Uh, all of that said, the bottom line here is that both of these leaders want this meeting. Uh, Kim Jong-un wants it and needs it because it gives to him what his predecessors, his father and grandfather, could never get, which was recognition and legitimacy from a meeting mm -hmm. with the President of the United States. President Trump needs it because he so hyped his ability to do what his predecessors couldn't do that not having this meeting would be uh, a huge embarrassment and, and, and failure up front. The critical thing, though, is that at best, this is the start of a process, uh, not the end of one. And it's going to take a long time to do this right meticulous preparation, meticulous negotiation, uh, and we've got a long road ahead of us. But it's a yeah. better place to be than where we were, you know, just a few weeks before the Olympics when it looked like we were heading to conflict. Tony, I wonder if you agree with some of what the top aides to the president are telling him, like, uh, like John Bolton. They're saying if you just have this cursory meeting with Kim Jong-un, it's going to be a diplomatic victory. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I think there's something to that. And I've, <laughs> yeah, it's a rare thing for me to be in, in agreement with, uh, with John Bolton, but I think he's right in the sense that the worst thing that could happen is for the president to go there, try to make some big deal, uh, which you, can't, you simply can't do uh, in one meeting, uh, and declare victory that turns out to be uh, hollow and actually gives North Korea things that it needs without getting anything for us in return. So I think if they see this as the start, an initial meeting, and then hand off whatever they're able to agree to uh, to negotiators. Look, it took almost two years to negotiate the agreement with Iran that President Trump, of course, has thrown out. He set an incredibly high standard for himself with that. By throwing out that agreement, he said the agreement he has to reach with North Korea has to be even better, even stronger. It's impossible to get that done in one meeting. And by the way, it may be impossible to get that done, period. Are the North Koreans actually going to dismantle the vast bulk of their nuclear program up front, as they did in the, as Iran did in the Iran deal? Are we going to get the most intrusive inspections regime in history in North Korea, as we did with Iran? That's a really high bar. But I think they're right to approach this in saying, look, the meeting itself will be a step forward. It can set the conditions and the atmosphere for talks going forward. Let's take our time. Let's mm -hmm. do this right. Let's not rush into a bad deal. Admiral, what, what about the folks that, that the president has at the highest levels uh, doing all of this work ahead of the summit if it happens? I mean, Tony Blinken has said, this is really the A-team, if you look at the ambassador to the Philippines, et cetera. The people surrounding the president doing the legwork right now, what do you make of them? I think, it, I think it definitely connotes how seriously this administration is taking this issue and trying to solve this problem and work it through diplomatically. I've said from the very beginning that of all the national security problems this administration has handled, they've done the best with North Korea. Has it been perfect? No. And, they, and, and the policy has been a little bit wavering at times, but they have worked together even with the previous team, when Tillerson was there, to, to solve this problem. So I give them high marks for that, for taking it as seriously as they are, for laying all this groundwork, for Secretary Pompeo's direct involvement. All that gives me a sense of optimism that the summit will happen. And mm -hmm. it also t tells me that all we, we may not be able to get denuclearization as a result of the summit itself, but that we'll maybe come out of it with a framework 
framework for negotiations moving forward. As Tony rightly says, it'll be the beginning of a long process, but I think that's a good thing. Admiral John Kirby, Tony Blinken, appreciate your time, guys.